So let's just get right into it. Low care fruit trees for the Pacific Northwest. Right away, I want to let you know that is kind of an oxymoron. Okay, fruit trees are never going to be part of your zero maintenance, low, you know, zero water, low tolerance landscape. It's just not part of it. They're always going to need some extra care from you because they're providing something extra for us, right? They're pro why are we even growing fruit trees? For fruit, they can also be beautiful, part of the habitat, but mostly you're going to give it some of your precious real estate because it's going to create something for you to eat. And since it's creating something extra for you to eat, it's going to need a little bit of extra love and attention from you in order to be able to do that. Because it takes quite a bit of energy to create fruit. It takes a little bit of extra effort. So we want to make sure we're really supporting our fruit trees so that they have energy available to reproduce, to make us that fruit. In general, these are the things, the basic needs of any fruit tree, no matter what kind it is. It's going to need certain light, space, soil, water, pollination. You're going to need to prune it and train it. How many of you have fruit trees? How many of you prune this year? Those hands should be the same. <laughs> we'll talk about that next class. Okay. Also, they're just going to need general overall maintenance. Very specifically, how much light do they need? How much though? Full sun is vague. Six to eight hours every day, even now. If you don't get that, talk to me about fruiting shrubs and vines, but your fruit trees are gonna be unhappy. So you gotta make sure they get enough sunlight. You gotta make sure they get enough space. You can have a honey crisp apple that's six feet tall, 16 feet tall, 26 feet tall, 36 feet tall. That's the rootstock. You wanna make sure you're giving it enough room to be its mature full size. Also, soil is very important. You know, Sherry just talked about it even when it comes to grass. Well draining, kind of as open as you can get it. We all have some amount of clay in our soil, but we can work with that, we can open that up. We want to keep it in that acidic range, slightly acidic, that's six to seven. Good news is, because of the way our soils were developed here in the Willamette Valley, most of our soils are already right in that zone of six to seven pH. And they want to have fairly high organic matter already mixed into that soil. So especially if you're thinking about planting new trees, it's going to be really worthwhile for you to consider testing your soil, something like what they've done today, or something more elaborate that you can do with some of the labs around town, and really figure out how you can set up your soil really well. Um, it's going to pay you back tenfold. The effort, the time, the money you spend understanding your soil up front is just going to ensure that you get healthy, fruitful plants in the long term. And then water. This is part of the reason why these are not zero maintenance plants. So it rains a lot here, but when? Winter time. Maybe up until June, right? When do trees need water the most? In the summertime. When's that fruit starting to ripen? When is the fruit starting to swell on an apple tree? May, June, right? And fruit trees, like our bodies and our planet, are mostly water. And what percentage of a fruit is water? 80 to 90 percent. So when the rain is no longer falling from the sky is the time when our fruit trees need water the most. What they're going to need is five gallons per tree per week. If it's between about six to ten feet tall, that should be okay. If you have a tree that's taller than ten feet tall, you may want to bump that up to ten gallons. But that again depends on the soil. Sometimes a, a 15 foot tall tree has a vast enough root system that, that, that it's getting some of its own water and you may just need to still stick with that five gallons. But this is really going to help your fruit <coughs> ripen and, and kind of develop better. So pollination, pruning and training, and general maintenance. Pollination, mo some fruit trees need cross-pollination. Some they need a second variety to pollinate. All of them need to be visited by pollinators. Wind poll or fruit pollen doesn't travel by the wind. You need creatures to show up and move it around for you. Pruning and training, stay tuned to the next class. 
too much to say there, but mostly you want to keep things open. Are we off the mark here? There we go. And then general maintenance. Again, I've taught four hour full day classes on all of these subjects and we have 25 minutes to continue. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but at the very minimum, you're gonna need to be pruning your trees, thinning the fruit, and harvesting the fruit. And that's if everything's going well. If some things are off, you may need to do some integrated pest management, you may need to do some cleaning up or some prevention for different pests and insects. So here's the thing, not all fruit trees are gonna grow the same here. Check out what's on this list. By the way, it is the first thing on your handout. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> what's on the challenging to difficult list? Now what's on the difficult list? Take a good look. Okay, there's reasons for this. By the, end of the, by the end of this 20 minutes, hopefully you'll know a bit better about why. The big deal here is that you wanna make sure you're choosing the right plant, putting it in the right place, following up with the right care. Where do we live? in the Willamette Valley, right? Coastal mountain range, Pacific Ocean, this is us, and this is east of the Cascades. A lot of times our pome and stone fruits, pome fruits are apples and pears, fruits with seeds inside. Stone fruits are cherries, peaches, plums, things with pits inside. A lot of different varieties of those fruiting trees are gonna have issues because right, like it, the fruit trees are blooming right now. Right? That's part of what they want to do. What's blooming first are all our cherries and our plums. Sometimes they bloom, it's still raining, their blooms get damaged by the water, you don't get a good fruit set. Oftentimes it's also too wet and too cold for some varieties. Where are, some, where are apples originally from? Midwest. Afghanistan. What's the weather like there? Kazakhstan. It's hot, it's dry. Is that, does that describe the Willamette Valley? No. So sometimes we are too wet and too cold for certain varieties to do well here. The other thing is that there's just multiple pests. Some of you may have run into codling moth, apple maggot, scale, mite, aphids, and then some diseases. There's a lot of things that can, are water-based usually. Water is a big thing here. It falls from the sky a lot. Too much water in the canopy can lead to all of these diseases. Too much water in your soil, if you don't have well-draining soil, can lead to those diseases. We like to call it mild, but we live in a very wet, cold place, according to fruit trees. So that's gonna inform us a little bit because if we try to pick a plant that wants it to be warmer and drier <clears throat> in general, and we put it here in the wet, rainy Willamette Valley, we are putting the wrong plant in the wrong place. And that's gonna lead to a weak plant. Weak plants get sick with lots of pests and diseases. So, Someone else read this out loud for me. If you can buy a variety of apple, pear, or cherry at the store, think twice before going it at home. Okay. If you can buy that variety of apple, pear, or cherry at the store, think twice before growing it at home. Why? Why? the right conditions. Most of those commercial varieties are grown east of the Cascades. Pear is the state fruit of Oregon. Where are those pear orchards? Hood River. Hood River's east of the Cascades. What, it's, what is it like over there? It's warm, it's drier, it's colder, but on average it's warmer and drier, okay? So you can grow a lot of really wonderful apples, a lot of really wonderful pears, but those apples aren't gonna have the name Pink Lady or Brereburn. We live, notice the colors, okay? What color is the Willamette Valley? Green, Green. blue. What color is where Hood River? Brown. Yeah, brown. Desert. desert, getting to be desert, right? Not a far cry from the Dalles. Windy, drying. So again, the good news is there are some things that are very easy to grow here in the Pacific Northwest. Let's review them really quickly. Persimmon does fantastic here. But the question is, do you like persimmon? No. Okay. I do, you may not, so it may not be the best choice for you, but if you are interested, they're beautiful, they're wonderful. How long do they take to fruit? Up to eight years from the time you plant them, but you're gonna pretty much be doing nothing during that time. There are um, Asian ones and there are American ones. Notice that the recommended varieties have early listed there. 
that so that the fruit, that's a variety of fruit that gets, that ripens earlier than most other ones. So you don't end up getting fruit that wants to ripen in like October, November, where we're starting to get cold and wet again. Now I will say that the list that you have on your handout and the list that's up here are just like the tip of the iceberg. They're the, the varieties that made it through a bunch of research and a bunch of hands-on on sort of trial and error in the Willamette Valley. It's not an exclusive list, but it's a strong, consistent, powerful list of varieties that will likely do really well for you no matter what our climate is gonna do. Because we may not agree about why, but I think we can all agree that our weather is shifting. It's different. We can't always tell exactly what it's gonna do. We never really could, but now more than ever. So figs, who here has fig trees? How many of them fruit every year? Mm, yeah, no. Part of that is because, again, a lot of fig trees are gonna grow here, but not a lot of them are gonna get enough heat units, AKA enough heat, during our summers to fully ripen that fruit. It'll set it, but it won't always ripen it. The only variety that I've seen ripen every year consistently, no matter what we do, is called the Desert King. Nice green fruit, red inside, quite delicious. Again, you can try other varieties. Maybe your figs actually fruited last year because we started getting 80 degree weather in April, right? Tomatoes also had a bumper crop year last year. It was really hot last year, but it isn't always here. The year before that, 2012, it rained until June 30th. Mulberries, also quite delicious and tasty. They're messy, but they're fun, they're beautiful. Consider growing those. And there's some other kind of less traditional, maybe you haven't heard of them before, but they're equally fruitful, nutritious, good for you, good for the birds. Elderberries are fantastic. Quince, medlar, strawberry tree, Arbutus unido. If you don't recognize them, take it home, Google search, have some fun. Can you eat strawberry? You can eat strawberry tree stuff. I wouldn't present to you anything that you can't eat. So here's the other thing. The more common stuff that you're used to growing, it's gonna be something that you're gonna have to make some tough choices about. If you're gonna consider growing these, it's super important you choose varieties that are well adapted or originated in the Willamette Valley. If you're gonna to try to grow any of these, I say your time and money is better spent having a nice picnic in Hood River come home with 50 pounds of organic peaches. Okay, why is cherry on there twice? Because the varieties really matter. Let's review. This is the recommended apple list. Read the avoid section first. What's on that? Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Here we go, try that. What's on that avoid apple list? Quite a few of the ones you get in the store. Okay, where are these grown? East of the Cascades, where do you live? West of the Cascades, different place requires different varieties. You may, not <clears throat> you may not recognize these varieties, but they're delicious, and some of them are gonna share characteristics with whatever it is you are familiar with. Notice that anything that has PRI in the name is Purdue, Rutgers, and Iowa. They developed those to be, they notice them to be more disease resistant. So take a look at that really quick. I'm gonna grab a drink of water. I have froggy throats. Has anyone ever tried any of those resistant varieties? Yeah, some head nodding. Now, does resistant mean I will never get diseased? No. <clears throat> you're still gonna have to do a little bit of extra love on these fruits. If you want anything close to what you're used to buying in the store, again, you're gonna need to participate in the life of your fruit tree once a month at least. There's something you should be doing every month with your fruit trees if you want them to grow fruit that is anything like what you're used to getting from the store. Here are some recommended pear varieties. You pretty much can grow whatever Asian pear you wanna grow. They just grow really quickly. They are quite vigorous, so their extra attention is gonna be on how to shape them well. Make sure that they don't like eat your yard. Recommended plum varieties. Quite a few of these are based on ones that flower later in the spring. So they have a better chance to actually have those flowers get pollinated and set you some fruit. Also, some of these varieties have shown to be a little bit more tolerant of having really wet roots. In general, if your plum tree is suffering, it's probably because it's too, the, water, the soil is too soggy, too damp, too heavy. Cherry varieties, check out the avoid list. 
Also, cherries are huge too. Even dwarfing cherries, even the smaller cherries that you can buy are still going to be between 15 and 20 feet tall. That's a big tree. It's a big tree to work with. So, if you are going to try, try some of these. Notice Rainier is up there. Maybe you recognize some of the other ones. So let's just review, because we're already most of the way through this presentation. Here are some of the easy to grow. These things are easy because either they don't get sick with diseases, they usually fruit without needing a whole bunch of extra attention, they don't necessarily, they're not going to run or grow or overtake your yard. You do need to understand how big they're going to be, though. How big do figs want to be? 20 to 30 feet. 20 to 30 feet. If you stay tuned for the next presentation, you'll understand that you can only take off 30% of a tree in one year without freaking it out. So what's 30% off of 30 feet? 10. So what's the smallest you're making that fig tree? 20 feet. And that is tall and wide. Okay, so easy care, but you still need to give it the amount of space that it needs because if you put it too close to something else, it's no longer easy. It's a fight that you get into every year about it wanting to be so big and you wanting it to be so small. Again, these guys are on this list because Asian pears, while fairly disease resistant, still tend to get some bugs in them and they grow really vigorously. Plums in general, right? They flower at an inconvenient time for the Pacific Northwest. They don't like wet feet. And then these guys. These guys are the ones where from here down, I honestly wouldn't recommend you try to grow your own cherries at home. It's a lot of work for what can be a very little payoff. It's also a lot of space to give over to those trees. So when given a choice, and, I, and my recommendations are based not only on university research and permaculture principles, but they're also based on the fact that I earn a living taking care of people's plants. So this is me actually trying to put myself out of a job. Okay, I want these plants to be easy and maintainable for you in an everyday life. Because while I love gardening, while I love the job that I do, I'm lazy in the sense that I don't want to do more work than I have to. So if you can make good decisions about putting the right plant in the right place to begin with, that's going to equal less care for you in the long run. And I don't know about you, but there's always other things I could do with my time, right? There's always more on the to-do list or something fun that I'd like to go do. And so I don't necessarily want to sign myself up for more work than I'm actually willing to do. So fruit trees are awesome, but they are kind of like having pets and kids. Not exactly, but you need to consider what exactly you're doing, what exactly you're saying yes to. I'll just quickly mention that part of what I do is teach people about this kind of stuff. I teach a lot around town. I also have a service where I come to people's homes. But if you want to know more about that, this is a website that shows the classes that I teach. And I can also do services at your house, but I want to make sure that there's time for questions and you can ask me about that later. So in the time that we have in between, we have a few more, we have more space for questions to ask right here. I also will stay in the hallway after the second presentation. But burning questions, yes. Well, so the blueberries, so if you're talking about the small fruits that are on there, the reason why, if you look at your handout, the top, very top of it, the easy, to the easy list includes a bunch of fruiting shrubs and vines. I put that on there because, again, if you're kind of feeling like, oh, fruit trees, hmm, and maybe I don't have enough sun or maybe I don't want to deal with a bunch of that work, those can be easier fruiting plants to grow. I just wanted to kind of put you out there. You can grow whatever blueberry you want. You just have to make sure that you've got two different varieties so they cross-pollinate well. Here's the thing, a lot of times the nurseries are going to want to sell you things you recognize, right? They're not trying to mislead you, they're not trying to make you work hard, it's just that it's kind of human nature that we gravitate towards things we're familiar with, right? But once again, we live in a region where the commercial growing orchards are conveniently located close enough to ship that fruit into our grocery stores, but in a different region, right? We get into a whole new bioregion just 45 minutes down I-84. Yes? What about fertilizing those fruit trees? What about fertilizing those fruit trees? It totally depends. It depends on your soil. If you're seeing between six to six inches to about three feet of new growth on your fruit trees, they have plenty of nutrition. They actually don't need to be fertilized regularly every year. But that then depends again on your soil, depends on what's already available. 
but you can cause issues over fertilizing. You tend to see a lot of, I saw a plum tree yesterday that had brand new growth, one year's worth of growth that was taller than me. Far too much nitrogen is getting to that plant. And when you put all that energy, when you give that much nitrogen, you ask the plant to put a bunch of energy into vegetative growth. And then the energy that's going into making that vegetative growth is now not available for making the fruit. Fruit is, you'll hear me use the term sometimes that fruit is expensive. It takes a lot of energy from a tree to make fruit. So in that case, fertilizing, you know, more is not better in most cases when it comes to that. And in that case, if you don't see a sign of squinchy growth, squinchy being small, runty, put together, um, if you're seeing less than 10 to six, like six to 10 inches of growth, then you wanna start thinking about fertilizer. And in that case, you also just can go to a nursery that you trust. They probably have a fruit tree blend and you, can kind, you wanna kind of dig a bit into the soil with just a, like maybe take a rod and make a hole and kind of fill it so it gets down into the roots. Um, but you don't want to dig and you don't want, you can just top dress with it as well. But particularly with fruit trees, it's easier to over fertilize them than to under fertilize. Yes? What kind of spraying? Oh, what kind of spraying? So that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> healthy trees tend to not need it as much. Apple scam? Well, you can interrupt that with cultural control. You want to be picking up your fruit, and you want to be picking up or mowing your leaves or covering your leaves, because that's where that fungus, those spores are living. And if you're not doing a good job sanitizing your orchard by picking up that stuff, it's just going to recreate the cycle. And even if you spray, it can still be present. So when we talk about integrated pest management, we use chemical controls last, right? We use cultural and physical controls before that. So a cultural control is pick a plant that's more disease resistant to apple scab to begin with, right? A physical control is remove the disease, remove the apples, remove the leaves. I would say try that first. And then if you still find you have a population that can't be overcome, another thing is pruning to open up for sunlight and airflow. Fungus tends to thrive in wet, cool environments. So if you open up your tree so it's drier and warmer, that's another physical control you can use to prevent apple scab. So, oh, go guys, we, <laughs> we're getting close to being done. I'll take two more questions. Yeah. So one thing you need to do is thin your fruit. You also, so that fruit don't touch. Where fruit touch, pests and diseases live. You should be thinning your apples and your pears 75% off in May. Then when the pears start to drop, the the little maggot that's inside there, the coddling moth maggot, will actually register that the fruit has dropped. It'll take about three days to crawl out, start its life cycle again. So if you can pick up your, first of all, thin so that apples aren't and pears aren't touching that make a perfect place for those insects to get in there. And you interrupt the cycle by picking up the fruit and not letting it, because how many cycles can coddling moth go through in a growing season? Three or four. So especially if you can get, a, there's a lot of coddling moth cultural control. I actually can't speak to it in the time that we have, but everything from wrapping your tree in cardboard so that they lay their eggs there instead of in your tree, and then you burn the cardboard, to wrapping them with little socks so they can't even get into your, you know, those little like ladies footwear footies. You can use those. There's a ton of things you can do. You can trap them. And again, spray is an option, but it's usually one that is limited in its use and that there are some other more effect, I won't say more effective, but there's some other very effective methods to do before you find you need to do that. Um, for your own safety, I would say try some of these other things first. And if they don't work, then you sort of graduate to the chemical controls. One more question. Yes. Yes. Uh, where, uh, for the apples especially, where mm -hmm. do we get the varieties? Where do you get those varieties? So the question is where do you get these less than common varieties? Quite a few nurseries. Are, can carry that One Green World, Rain Tree Nursery, Burnt Ridge Nursery, are all local within about 100 miles of here. Well, you should look them up. One Green World, Burnt Ridge, and Rain Tree Nursery. Okay, they sell a lot of them. Also, the more I teach, <laughs> I'll actually teach at Portland Nursery later today, the more people are starting to carry these varieties. Yeah. So. Well, why do they sell us all those other apples? Why do they sell you? Because again, you recognize it. The other thing is, do you guys know that Oregon grows over 50% of the nursery stock that goes, ships out to the rest of the nation? Okay, so we're growing everything here. So we have access to a ton of stuff 
that will grow just fine but may not fruit really well, right? We have access, but just because we can get it doesn't mean we should plant it, okay? And again, the nurseries aren't trying to be bad guys. They're just trying to sell you stuff you recognize. And sometimes they don't even know this information either. So go be empowered to ask for what's going to be better for you. Thank you.